Welcome to our virtual symposium on PSMA Imaging, Current Status and Prospects. I'm Dr. Oliver Sarder from Tulane University. I'm really excited today to be able to present some of the latest information on PSMA PET. I'd also like to thank Telix Pharmaceuticals for giving us support to speak at this special symposium. I'd like to add that unless otherwise noted, none of the agents mentioned in any of the speakers' presentation are approved for use in the U.S. or any other jurisdiction. All the content within the following presentations are the sole opinion and experiences of the speakers and not that of Telix Pharmaceuticals. I think everybody is aware in nuclear medicine about the potential importance of PSMA PET and its ability to influence the prostate cancer management. I think everyone is aware that we can anticipate FDA approvals. Sometimes that might even come in the next year. That's not clear. It's really a pleasure to be able to introduce two prominent speakers that I think are gonna provide some additional insights. We started with Dr. Jeremy Collet, faculty member in the Department of Nuclear Medicine at UCLA, very renowned on their work for PSMA. And Jeremy's gonna be covering Gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET-CT. And it's really a delight to have him here today. And then we have Dr. Jeffrey Carnes from the Mayo Clinic, the Department of Urology. He's going to be covering the implications of the Gallium 68 PSMA 11 scanning. Jeff has been working for years with PET CT, colon PET, PSMA PET, and he's going to be providing new insights about how to interpret these scans from a clinical perspective. And as mentioned, I'm Dr. Oliver Sarter. I'm going to wrap things up with some issues about systemic disease. With that said, I'd like to begin with Dr. Jeremy Collet. But again, I'd like to emphasize that unless otherwise noted, None of the agents mentioned in any of the speaker's presentation are approved for use in the U.S. or any other jurisdiction. All the contexts within the following presentations are the sole opinions and experiences of the speakers, not that of TLX Pharmaceutical. With that said, take it away, Jeremy. All right. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to share my experience with Gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET CT. Uh, thanks for uh, the invitation, Telix, and the nice presentation, Dr. Sartor. So here's the plan of my presentation today. Uh, first, I'm going to do a brief reminder about the PSMA target for nuclear diagnostics. Then I will briefly go over the Gallium 68 PSMA 11 preparation. And then the main focus of the presentation will be the methods and tips uh, for reading Gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET. So first, what is PSMA? PSMA, prostate specific membrane antigen. It is also known as folate hydrolase 1, folate 1 for the metabolic people, glutamate carboxypeptidase 2 for the neurology people. So it is not prostate specific. Uh, this is a cell surface, transmembrane glycoprotein enzyme. Most of its part is in the extracellular space, making it an accessible target for uh, nuclear diagnostics compounds. So it is not prostate specific, but it is highly overexpressed uh, by the prostate cancer cell. And because this high overexpression up to 100 to 1000 fold is observed in about 95% of the prostate cancer cases by immunohistochemistry. That is why it's a good target for uh, nuclear diagnostics. Here is a, a summary of multiple articles showing the percentage of, of tumor stain positive for PSMA. Interestingly, you can see that it's maybe less expressed uh, in more advanced disease in the bone and in the lymph nodes, Metast in the visceral metastasis, in comparison to the primary tumor and the lymph node at earlier disease stage. And then you have these small peptides, inhibitors, that have a binding motif specific for the extracellular part of PSMA that can bind to PSMA with very high affinity rapid clearance from the plasma, get internalized into the cells just after binding, and these peptides can be labeled with positron radionuclide emitters, such as fluor 18 or gallium 68, and that we can use to make uh, PET images. PSMA is not expressed only in prostate tissue. You can see here the normal biodistribution with the salivary gland, kidneys, liver, duodenum, and the urinary excretion of the tracer. This is a 3D MIP of gallium 68 PET. And here is an example of what it can look like in a prostate cancer patient. This is the example of a patient with a nine prostate cancer referred for initial staging. CT and bone scan did not show any lesion. 
and here's the PSMA PET 3D MIP. You can see very easily these black dots here. These correspond to prostate cancer lesions. You can see the very high contrast, high tumor to background ratio that makes gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET fairly easy to read, a little bit like dotatate. And unlike the metabolic tracers, choline, flucyclovine, or FDG, which are a bit more difficult to read. In yellow, you have the primary tumor. In blue are the pelvic lymph node metastasis, and in red, two bone metastases. Now, how gallium-68 PSMA-11 is prepared? PSMA-11 is labeled with gallium-68. Gallium-68 is obtained with a germanium gallium generator. All of these are generators. Basically, you wait that the father nucleus, the germanium, decays, and then you can elute some fresh gallium-68 for your preparation. Then you can label the cold PSMA-11 compound with the gallium-68. Fairly easy to do with the, the kit. It takes about five to 10 minutes. And then you have your uh, radio tracer ready to use for PET imaging. After one hour of uptake, um, you can get PET images. So now the main part of the presentation will be about how do we read PSMA PET. First, like for every hybrid nuclear imaging modality, such as PET CT imaging, you need to always read PSMA PET CT with nine views axial, coronal, sagittal, PET only, CT only, and fused PET CT. And the 3D MIP also helps a lot to get a quick overview of what is going on in the patient. So you start with that. Now, what the clinician needs to know is where are the prostate cancer lesions, of course. Management changes depend on the prostate cancer lesions locations. Basically, the clinician need follows the TNM classification like for every cancer. Local prostate, regional pelvic therapy, extra pelvic disease, single versus oligometastatic versus polymetastatic disease. And on PSMA PET, you can see with a good level of confidence, bilateral disease in the prostate, seminal vesicle involvement, N1 disease and M1 disease. To answer that need, and by uh, taking advantage of the whole body imaging assessment of PSMA PET, we have developed in collaboration with our experts, a standardized molecular imaging reporting system adapted from the TNM classification called PROMISE. It is a standardized way to report the prostate cancer locations in a TNM-like system. It allows the different physicians across different specialty to talk the same language. You can see here various stage of uh, extent of the disease uh, in red with a corresponding code line for each. We also do relative quantification of the PSM expression of the lesions in comparison to organs of reference, salivary gland, liver, blood pool, corresponding to high intermediate or low level of PSM expression. So the relative ratio is maybe better than just a value of SUV. For the prostate local T staging, you can assess with decent reliability the T2C, T3A, T3B disease. T2C is bilateral disease. It is, no, it is now uh, known that PSMA PET detects more bilateral and uh, multifocal disease than MRI. Although, of course, MRI is the reference imaging modality for the T staging. It's just that PSMA PET can show additional lesions, usually secondary or tertiary uh, lesions. And uh, T3A is the extracapsular extension, and T3B is the seminal vesicle invasion. And the positive predictive value for T3 disease detection by PSMA PET is excellent. Basically, when you see images like that here or here, you can rely with good confidence on PSMA PET to consider that the disease has spread out of the capsule or in, uh, like here in the seminal vesicles. This can have an impact on focal therapy, nerve sparing, sur surgery, or, or radiation boost. Here is an, an example of a left perirectal lymph node and a left supraclavicular lymph node of about a few millimeters that were highly PSMA PET positive. Now, just careful, gallium-68 PSMA-11 PET has the same limitation than any other PET-CT technique. And you cannot go beyond the detection limit of PET. This uh, very famous uh, figure for FDG PET shows that under 10 to the seventh cells with FDG uptake, PET is not able to detect the lesion. 
And this is why we still only see the visible parts of the iceberg on PSMA pets as well. As an example, in this prospective multicenter trial, including 277 patients with gallium 68 PSMA 11 pets, who all had pelvic nodal dissection and thus histopathology gold standard, all these patients were negative by MRI and CT. So the sensitivity of gallium 68 PSMA 11 pet was 40%, which is way better than zero. But it means we still miss two thirds of the patients, mostly with micrometastasis. It has been shown that 90% of the lymph nodes with a tumor deposit of five millimeters or more can be detected by PSMA PET, whereas only half of them of the lymph nodes with a tumor deposit of two millimeters, which were, are detected by PSMA PET. So you cannot go beyond that limitation. And of course, there are some pitfalls, like with every imaging modality. They are now pretty well known. Uh, I will go over the most common ones. One of which is the ganglia. Non-millionic nerves, for uh, some reason, have some PSM expression and can mimic lymph node metastasis because they can be located at the same place, especially in the presacral area, um, in the celiac area, or the cervical, uh, supracervical lymph node area. Uptake is faint or intermediate with an SUV max ranging from 1.5 to 3. But once you, you know the pattern, the typical anatomic location, the usually uh, the symmetry that you can see on, on the PET only coronal images when scrolling to it, you see here symmetry uh, with a typical shape on the CT, elongated shape, then you can get rid of it with a little experience. Like most of any nuclear medicine tracers, any bone trauma with fracture or not can show some gallium 68 PSMA 11 uptake. So CT helps a lot here by showing either sclerosis for metastasis or fracture like here. But the rib lesion can still sometimes remain very tricky when they are isolated and new. You have to use all the other info, pre-test likelihood of having metastasis, the trauma history, single versus multiple lesion, the presence of other metastasis. At the end, when you have a single focus with faint uptake that is new without clear sclerosis, it is usually not a metastasis. Another one, uh, again here, like with most of any PET tracer, inflammatory lymph nodes can show some uptake, especially in the inguinal area or the mediastinal lymph nodes. And again, faint and symmetric uptake suggests more an inflammatory or granulomatosis cause. We also have to relearn the pattern of prostate cancer spreading. For example, lung was thought to be a, a rare site of prostate cancer metastasis or seen only in very advanced patients. But we have now numerous cases of patients with early disease and histopathological proven solitary pulmonary prostate cancer metastasis detected by PSMA PET. And we are now discovering even new patterns of lung metastasis of prostate cancer, such as in this case, a ground, grass, a ground glass nodule, which turned out to be a prostate cancer metastasis. One of the main weakness of gallium 68 PSM11 PET is the urinary excretion of the tracer leading to a, a high ureteral and bladder activity. This can make the analysis of the prostate fossa sometimes uh, difficult. You can see here, local recurrence kind of hidden uh, as well here in the bladder urinary activity. First rule to analyze the prostate fossa is to adjust the color scale um, of, the, of your PET images or the grayscale here. In this example, you can see that the maximum, 37, of the color scale is very high. It can allow to better differentiate the background bladder activity from the tumor lesion here. Always look at the nine views, especially the sagittal or coronal views and of PET only as well, and scrolling into it uh, to look under the bladder to look for any uh, focal uptake. Another way to get rid of this high bladder activity is to dilute the urine activity. These two rows represent the same patients, top row with diluted urine activity, bottom row without dilution. You can clearly see the difference, uh, how the local recurrence is easily seen here uh, on the top row, whereas it's missed on the bottom row, kind of blurred by the rest of the urinary activity. So you can obtain that by uh, giving diuretics uh, just after the tracer administration 
or uh, with hyperhydration before the image, the image acquisition. The difficult part here is uh, that the patient has to hold the urine under the image acquisition and sometimes it's difficult with uh, prostate cancer patients. And one last thing to do is to perform a late pelvic bed after voiding. It has been shown that uh, PSMA11 tumor uptake tends to increase over time, whereas benign lesions tend to have a decreasing curve of gallium-68 PSMA11 uptake. Here on the left is a left pelvic lymph node metastasis with increasing uptake, 60 minutes late pelvic bed. And here on the right is a benign lymph node with decreasing uptake, 60 minutes late pelvic bed. And this will now be my last slides. I'm going to give my, my tips on how to read gallium-68 PSMA11 PET-CT. So first, like for any imaging scan, you have to consider the clinical context and the question the clinician is asking. It is not the same to characterize a potential metastasis lesion in a patient who, with no known metastasis or in a patient with known widespread disease. Your level of sensitivity will not be the same. Also, the PSA is very important because the PSA level is directly correlated to the sensitivity of the scan. So it gives you some kind of pre-test likelihood of positivity. Then always uh, start by your first global look on the 3D MIP and by scrolling into the coronal PET only images to get an overview of the global scenario of the scan and what may be going on in the patient. Then we follow a systematic TNM based read starting with the prostate fossa below the bladder. You have to adjust the scaling to the background bladder activity level and scroll into the coronal and sagittal PET only images to look under the bladder and chase for any focal uptake. And also use the late pelvic acquisition after voiding to try to get some uh, longitudinal information over time. Then pelvic nodal staging. Don't forget the perirectal and presacral lymph nodes, which are now known to be very frequent common site of spreading. And because the perirectal or the mesorectum area is a fatty area, you have a low background signal and, and you're chasing very tiny lymph nodes here. So you need to decrease the grayscale maximum increase the sensitivity of the signal to increase your sensitivity. And beware of the sacral ganglia. Remember, coronal view spet only, scroll through it and see if there is some kind of symmetry or bilaterality. Same for the celiac area and the supraclavicular area, which is another quite common site of disease location. For the lung, same thing here, a lot of air and low or no background signal. So you need to decrease the grayscale maximum and increase the sensitivity of the signal to increase your sensitivity for these lung nodules. And again, lung is not an uncommon site of disease, even at early stage. Liver lesions are mostly seen in advanced patients with MCRPC. It has a high pronostic value, so it is important. For this, uh, you have to adapt the grayscale to the liver background activity to chase for any focal uptake on the PSMA PET. But you also have to look at the CT uh, and you have to narrow the Hounsfield unit CT window to increase your tissue contrast and chase for hyperdense PSMA negative lesion because in the liver it's quite frequent to have PSMA negative lesions. And this will be my final slide. Basically, if you have a faint uptake, diffuse, not really focal, that is isolated, you can have sometimes a symmetric on the coronal views in an uncommon location for prostate cancer spread that decrease on late acquisition. And with a CT correlate pattern uh, that evokes another cause, it's probably not prostate cancer. On the other hand, if you have intense uptake, focal, and you also have already known other metastatic lesion, you clearly see asymmetry and coronal views. It is in a common location for prostate cancer spread, which now includes perirectal nodes, uh, lung or supraclavicular left uh, nodes and you have either an increase or stable uptake over time on a late acquisition, then it's probably more uh, suspicious for a prostate cancer lesion. So this will be my last slide. I thank you very much for your attention and I give time to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Jeremy, that was really interesting and thoughtful. I appreciate your insights. Thank you for sharing your work that you've been doing in this area. This is of tremendous importance and really no doubt is gonna be helpful for our listeners in terms of understanding how to deal with these PSMA scans and how to work with it. 
Now let me introduce Dr. Jeffrey Carnes, Professor of Urology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, who's going to be discussing the implications of the Gallium-68 PSMA scanning. I want to emphasize that all the contents within the following presentation is a sole opinion and experience of this speaker and not of Telex Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarder, for that uh, kind introduction and for Dr. Calais for that excellent uh, comprehensive overview. Now we'll switch gears a little bit and discuss some uh, clinical implications of PSMA-based uh, uh, scanning. Uh, this, the show will be um, separated into three parts. First, we'll address staging. Next, uh, recurrence after definitive therapy. And then the concept of oligometastatic prostate cancer. Uh, this is a recently published study in The Lancet involving multi-centers in Australia. Um, where they investigated the role of what is considered the gold standard for staging of high-risk prostate cancer, uh, a CT and a bone scintigraphy. We know that this, um, these imaging modalities has limited uh, sensitivity and specificity. In this randomized trial of over 300 men, about half were randomized to conventional uh, CT pelvis and bone scan and half to uh, PSMA uh, Gallium-68 uh, PET-CT. It was a crossover design with the initial imaging being done and then crossing over in two weeks with the alternative imaging. The methods here you see regarding the inclusion criteria, uh, arguably um, um, uh, everyone agrees um, that these do represent um, high-risk features, um, save for perhaps the, the grade three. However, we'll see that in the enrollment, actually most of these were very high risk. Exclusion, any staging study prior to eight weeks, save for the MRI. The primary outcome of the study was the accuracy, defined here as the area under the curve of the first line imaging before the crossover for either clinical lymphadenopathy or actually metastatic disease. The reference standard was actually a predefined uh, composite panel that looked at six months after randomization that involved histopathology, uh, the imaging, the clinical and biochemical findings of the patients. Uh, on the other side of the screen, you actually see the schema uh, that was published in their article. Results here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, almost uh, all of the patients actually had high-grade disease uh, greater than uh, group three. Uh, so these were four and five. Uh, a lot had high PSAs. A quarter or so had a stage three or four, a median age of 68. And uh, 30% uh, had either clinical lymph nodes or clinical metastasis at the composite uh, uh, endpoint um, based on consensus decision at six months. Um, the area of the curve was a difference of about 30% favoring a PSMA uh, based PET CT scan over conventional imaging and detection of either clinical lymph nodes or clinical metastasis. For the results, there were uh, obviously more equivocal findings with conventional imaging here at 23% versus less than 10% for PSMA-based PET scanning. The PSA, PSMA imaging was more likely to change the management of these patients at initial diagnosis. The PSMA resulted in uh, less radiation exposure, around eight millisieverts compared to 19 millisieverts. The co conclusion of this study was that the PSMA-based uh, PET-CT as initial staging significantly outperform, outperformed the conventional uh, standard imaging. And if this is externally val validated, it will likely become the standard of care as we stage high-risk prostate cancer. And it's changing management and diagnosis, hopefully allowing us to diagnose perhaps even oligometastatic disease and intervene earlier in the course of our, our therapies. Next, we'll go to uh, PET. Uh, use in mapping or monitoring the recurrence after either radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. This is a study that uh, I performed uh, based on our experience, not in PSMA PET, but actually C11 choline. And this was the data that led to the FDA approval for the PET specific uh, prostate cancer indication and recurrent disease. It was a retrospective analysis of uh, patients. Uh, that we looked at consecutively between 2007 and 2010 and looked at obviously only of those that had biochemical recurrence. And we validated the findings by choline PET, either by conventional imaging, biopsy or surgical resection, or response to selective radiation. The main point I want to bring up with this study uh, is that the whether it's a, a PSMA PET or choline PET, 
the uh, performance accuracy will be influenced by the PSA. So the lower the PSA, typically the lower performance accuracy and the higher the PSA, uh, the counter. Moving into uh, Dr. Collet's study on the comparing uh, flucyclovine or Actumin uh, PET-CT versus PSMA PET-CT in patients with early biochemical recurrence or BCR after prostatectomy. This was a prospective single center open label single arm comparative study. It enrolled patients with PSAs between 0.2 and 2, and this was prior to any salvage therapy. Patients underwent the flucyclovine PET scan as the reference test, and then the PSMA PET scan uh, within approximately two weeks. The detection rate of recurrence at the patient level and by anatomical region was the primary endpoint, and appropriate statistical power analysis was performed in this to show a test for su superiority in favor of PSMA over uh, flucyclovine PET scan. Here's the results. So 143 patients were screened uh, in the given year of 2018, and 50 patients were enrolled. The follow-up was eight months. The detection rates were significantly lower with the flucyclovine PET at approximately a quarter than with patients with the PSMA PET, which is approximately 50%, with a, a high odds ratio of close to five. Now, the differences were observed whether it was in the pelvic regions, here at 8% versus 30%, or in a sub-analysis of any extra pelvic lesions. In conclusion, uh, the use of the PSMA PET uh, actually found twice more uh, sites metastasis than the flucyclovine PET CT. Uh, these findings could not be validated by a gold reference standard such as histology uh, because the, um, there was uh, no findings uh, for that. Uh, nonetheless, the detection, as I mentioned, was twice higher than flucyclovine. And the results of this prospective head-to-head -head comparison between PSMA and flucyclovine favors PET as the favored tracer or molecular imaging of choice when it comes to evaluating men who have undergone prostatectomy with a PSA recurrence and low PSA concentrations at less than two. So in Europe, these are a part of the EAU guidelines in 2019, where um, choline and PSMA PET have been fairly ubiquitous in their performance. But here you see highlighted in the recommendations to look at performing a PSMA PET CT if the PSA level is greater than 0.2, if the results will influence subsequent treatment decisions. And the same goes with PSA recurrence after radiotherapy, um, if it would allow the patient to perhaps undergo some sort of salvage uh, and hopefully curative treatment. This was a mapping study uh, that I think uh, highlights the um, influence that PET imaging can have on our management. This is what would be sort of the untreated natural history of biochemical recurrence after surgery. This was 260 men, all had biochemical recurrence, all declined some form of standard of care salvage therapy. So it's a pure untreated cohort no post-operative radiation, no post-operative ADT or antigen deprivation therapy. The median PSA of this group was two, and they were studied with uh, both MRI and C11 choline PET scans, and over three quarters had a positive scan. Most importantly in this study, what we did is we mapped the recurrences and found that only about a third actually had a FOSA recurrence only. About 10% had a FOSA with a pelvic node recurrence, and about 20% actually had pelvic node recurrence only, and less than 5% had sort of these atypical locations that Dr. Kalei alluded to in the perirectal lymph nodes and in the presacral region. Most importantly, this is a theoretical treatment effect um, with variable radiations to the field, and obviously it's theoretical, but perhaps molecular imaging such as uh, PSMA PET will allow us to better uh, define treatment uh, for the right patient at the right time and in the right location. Also, uh, with these sites of recurrence uh, being able to be mapped with a median PSA of 2.3, uh, certainly it provides a treatment conundrum. Do we let the patients declare themselves uh, with uh, these sites of metastasis, or do, do we intervene at a very early PSA? Uh, this verdict is still out. The median time from the biochemical recurrence to the identification of disease with updated imaging was 15 months, not the Hopkins data that was eight years from biochemical recurrence to a positive conventional bone scan. A third of patients had a pure local recurrence, and, but two thirds actually had disease still confined to the pelvis 
without distant metastasis, again, begging the question whether we can intervene in these patients uh, with salvage therapies with curative intent. So what investigators have done with the use of this molecular imaging and really sort of have revolutionized how we look at prostate cancer in the form of metastasis-directed therapy for oligometastasis that are basically few metastases, which has been done in other malignancies, but with prostate cancer, uh, this was novel. Uh, these are, this is from a group of uh, Belgium investigators that looked at uh, patients who had biochemical recurrence. They screened them with a choline PET scan. If they had oligometastatic disease, that was defined as three or less sites of metastasis, they underwent randomization to either radiotherapy or surgery to the metastasis or active clinical surveillance. They had a defined reason to start androgen deprivation therapy uh, for this study. In the publication in Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2018, Ost et al. Uh, uh, demonstrated their results. There was not um, uh, survival outcomes as of now, but here I provide you this graph of the median uh, freedom of hormonal therapy of 13 months with metastasis-directed therapy versus 21 months with uh, surveillance at a median follow-up of three years. On the concept of uh, metastasis-directed therapy, a salvage lymph node uh, dissection has been heavily investigated as a form of that. Uh, this was a multi-center um, international study of comparing PSMA versus choline as it pertains to uh, being able to uh, discern the estimation, estimation of tumor burden. Here there were 641 patients who underwent extended salvage lymph node dissection. Uh, they were either diagnosed with a C11 choline PET scan or a PSMA-based uh, PET scan. The outcome was, as I mentioned, tumor burden or the underestimation of tumor burden. The number of positive nodes at salvage node dissection minus the number of positive spots seen on the PET CT scan. Here you see the statistical analysis. And to sort of summarize, these were the important findings and the results of the study, and that at a very low uh, PSA level here defined as less than or equal to 1.5, with one or two uh, positive spots seen in lymph nodes, you can see that the PSMA outperformed choline in more adequately assessing tumor burden. Here with a p-value of, of uh, statistical significance for one positive spot or two positive spots, again, at a low PSA, defined at 1.5 or less, and at a PSA that we need to diagnose these patients. In addition, uh, this study was recently published in European Urology. It's a prospective single center study of patients with oligometastatic disease, uh, diagnosed based on PSA recurrence, uh, and they underwent uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy to the oligometastatic sites. Uh, this included patients who had either lymph nodes or bone, again, all without hormonal therapy, there were uh, 57 patients eligible. 50 patients had previously undergone a radical prostatectomy. The primary endpoint was biochemical failure after the intervention of the stereotactic radiotherapy. Here are the results and the observations. There were 73 lesions treated. 44 had a solitary metastasis, while 13 had two to three metastasis. The majority were lymph node only disease, while 18% or 30% had bone only metastasis. You see the waterfall plot showing the PSA response following the stereotactic radiotherapy, where 70% actually had a PSA decline. Again, this was without any hormonal therapy, and over 10% had a complete biochemical response with the intervention. Again, highlighting the potential power of molecular imaging, identifying a local metastatic disease, and then intervening on it. Here, the median follow-up was 16 months, and the median biochemical uh, recurrence-free survival was 11 months. So almost a year of benefit with 30% actually having freedom of biochemical recurrence at 15 months. The intervention was successful in that the majority um, had no infill failures after stereotactic radiotherapy. But as Jeremy alluded to, uh, the PET imaging cannot find micrometastasis uh, always. So to conclude, I think that PET imaging or molecular imaging has certainly changed how we tend to prostate cancer and its recurrence here as a biochemical recurrence going forward. It certainly has fueled the growth of oligometastatic or oligorecurrent prostate cancer and provides all of us unique opportunities of how best to diagnose and how best to intervene on our patients with this disease. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was a fantastic presentation, a beautiful review of the literature, and your clinical insights are very much appreciated. So that being said, I'll wrap things up now with a brief talk on pet imaging and advanced prostate cancer. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Oliver Sarder, medical director of the Tulane Cancer Center in both the departments of medicine and urology. And once again, all the content within this presentation is my opinion and experience and not that of Telix Pharmaceuticals. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'm gonna go on to talk about pet imaging and advanced prostate cancer. And this is a little bit of a different talk. Uh, but we'll start out by talking about the various pet possibilities in the detection of prostate cancer. And it's not just the PSMA PET that you're all aware of, but that is the most important new imaging. And PSMA PET can come in a variety of, of different isotopes, gallium 68, F18, potentially even new data with copper 64s or conium 89, but there are no FDA approvals here yet. Uh, choline PET, and that's been FDA approved thanks to Mayo. Uh, Flucyclovine, which we've heard about, approved. And then FTG PET uh, with F18, and that is not FDA approved and not approved in prostate cancer specifically, is FDA approved, of course, in other diseases. And sodium chloride PET. But today we're going to be talking about that PSMA PET, particularly the gallium 68. PSMA is that transmembrane protein. I, I think we all know, but I just wanted to review it briefly. Uh, the vast majority of the protein is extracellular, and you can bind with these small molecules, and that's one of the reasons that you can get such crisp imagery. Uh, Dr. Clay covered some of the other tissues that can have PSMA uptake, but of course, they're reproducible and don't really interfere that much with the detection of cancer, except for the ganglion. The ganglion are tricky. Now, the PSMA PET detection rate, uh, I think we all know, is extraordinarily sensitive. Uh, here's uh, data from UCLA. Uh, looking at in recurrent patients, the PSA ranges and the proportion of patients that are PSMA PET positive. And you can see once you get above 0 0.5, that the majority of patients are going to be PSMA positive. And even less than 0 0.5, you can end up with 30 to 40% of the patients being positive. So really, really sensitive testing, which is why it's changing the clinician's view of this disease. Now, we've emphasized so far PET imaging for localization of disease, but broadly speaking, PET imaging is going to transform not only the localization of disease, but also the way we characterize phenotype, assess the microenvironment for use as predictive and prognostic biomarkers and a response biomarker. So it's a whole lot more than just localization of disease. Next part of my talk is going to about these predictive and prognostic biomarkers and response biomarkers that I think are going to be part of the future about how the nuclear medicine community is going to be asked to assess these particular scans. And the PSMA PET has been used as a predictive biomarker. And this is something I think will be very important in the future because we have a whole variety of PSMA therapeutics that are going to be coming into the clinic in the years ahead. Lutetium 177 PSMA, Actinium 225 PSMA, and also some PSMA CD3 biospecifics and immunologic approach to PSMA. All of these are in the clinical trial setting now and I think are going to be FDA approved at some point in the future. So this is the reason you need to understand it. It's what are the optimal selection criteria for therapeutic responsiveness? What are the distribution of uptake? So let's look at these with advanced disease and begin to understand where we are. First of all, if we talk about the Lutetia 177 PSMA trials, and there are a variety of them now, there are a, a very diverse set of selection criteria. If you go to the Cornell, Tagawa, Bander uh, clinical trials, they've actually using no selection, which is a little bit of a surprise, uh, but they believe that perhaps with dose, they can overcome some of the shortcomings of using PSMA as a selection marker. They're probably a bit in the minority, um, but that's okay. We need to hear from that uh, minority view. And then we have some of the UCLA Excel diagnostic criteria in phase two, where they 
use just a visual inspection. And then we look to the vision trial, which is a very important trial, phase three trial, and they haven't fully disclosed exactly how the selection criteria is going to take place, but they're going to look at PSMA uptake relative to liver and then exclude those with measurable disease that were, quote, PSMA negative. The therapy trial has recently reported, it's a randomized phase two out of Australia, and they had a very precise definition of the PSMA criteria, and they used it in combination with FTG PET positivity. And I'm going to cover that in a little more detail here in just a second. What does the distribution of SUB look like in metastatic disease? Well, this has been looked at in some of the Tagawa studies. And the first of all, they found that virtually everybody that had PSMA uptake had PSMA uptake that was liver or higher. Uh, the majority of patients, about 63%, had five times the liver SUV max. And so these were fairly hot lesions. But then you can see there were a few lesions that were in between. I now like to cover the therapy trial, the one out of Australia, randomized trial, phase two, randomized 200 patients. And they used either Lutetium 177 PSMA or Cabazitaxel. But how they selected the patients is what I wanted to concentrate on here. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see those patients were PSMA negative and FTG positive. Those patients were not allowed in the trial. If the patients were PSMA positive, but then had FDG positive lesions or PSMA negative, and by the way, look at the liver there, and you can see those that I'm talking about, those patients were declared ineligible and not enrolled in the trial. They actually ended up excluding about 28% of patients after they were assessed by the scans. But they had 200 eligible patients. And of these 200 eligible patients, they either had a matching scan for both FTG and PSMA, or they were PSMA positive and FTG negative. So that's how they set their selection criteria, along with some SUV uptakes. By the way, just very briefly sharing you the results, this is PSMA declines after the PSMA Lutetium 177. And you can see that there were some pretty impressive results when it came to the best PSA response. In fact, it was better than chemotherapy, and that chemotherapy cabazitaxel is FDA approved. One of the ways that people have been thinking about selection is simply by looking at salivary uptake. And here's a publication from the Journal of Nuclear Medicine a little bit earlier in 2020. And you can see that using the salivary uptake criteria, if those individuals who had either more intense or iso-intense findings in the salivary gland had better outcomes in terms of progression-free survival, and this is after the PSMA Lutetium 177 therapy. One of the things that there's been a fair amount of work on, but we still need to do more work on, is looking at gallium-68 PSMA PET SUV uptake, and then comparing that to the Lutetium-177 dosimetry. And as you can see here on this slide from Violet et al., that there's clearly a correlation. The, the row is 0 0.61, which is good, p-value less than 0 0.01, but clearly there's some outliers. And that's important to note. It's not a perfect correlation in, in the dosimetry world, and that's something that will need to be explored further. One of the other important factors is looking at the PSA decline. So this is a response simply predicted on the SUV uptake of the gallium-68 PSMA-11. And again, I'm going to go to the violet paper and show you this particular graph from that paper. And you can see that there is a relationship between the gallium-68 PSMA-11 uptake, but it's far from perfect. So other factors matter too. And these other factors may be the genomics of the tumor, the previous treatments, uh, the location of the PSMA uptake, and others. So there is more to study on this important topic. What do we know about gallium-68 PSMA-11 scans in terms of measuring response to therapy? And first of all, I'm going to say that we don't really know as much as we need to know because the response assessments can vary depending on the type of therapy, the timing, and the site of disease. Some of the therapies we use in prostate cancer include androgen deprivation therapies, and we know that PSMA uptake can change over time. 
we can use the PSMA lutetium 177, but we know that PSMA lutetium is going to target the PSMA molecule, not all of the tumors. And we have novel hormonal therapies such as enzalutamide, abiraterone, and we know now that they can have biphasic PET responses, so we have to be a little bit careful. Chemotherapy evaluations with PSMA PET are all fairly limited, but external beam radiation does seem clear. If you radiate a spot and that spot goes away, that does seem to correlate with response. So that's also important to know in this age of oligometastatic disease and the use of SBRT and other forms of external beam radiation. A caveat that we do need to recall, there's no doubt that PSMA imaging is a better way to image. It's more sensitive. We can see the distribution of lesions better than with conventional imaging. But when we're assessing the PSMA images after PSMA targeted therapies, such as lutetium 177, we know that only the PSMA expressing cells are going to be imaged, and you can have growth potentially of non PSMA expressing lesions, and that may require alternative assessment. Currently, these alternative assessments are cross sectional imaging, such as CT or MRI, although there are some individuals who are using the FTG PET as well. So we still have more to learn about PSMA targeted therapy and how to interpret what exactly means and how responses can be measured and how progression can be measured. Now, one of the things that we've learned about antigen deprivation, it was a little bit surprising, and that was that the ADT can induce different responses as measured by a PSMA PET by the location of the disease. The PSMA detected partial and complete responses more commonly in lymph nodes than it did in non-nodal sites. And no patient after antigen deprivation therapy had a complete PSMA imaging response for disease in the prostate. So again, some of this is a little bit surprising and we're, we're gonna have to be uh, understanding more before we can fully interpret what all these changes make. Now in a surprising finding, an important caveat, is that enzalutamide can potentially increase PSMA expression in those with castrate resistant disease. Here on the panel A, you're looking at the uptake of PSMA PET before enzalutamide, and panel B, it's afterwards. And you can see new lesions. And this is important because it turns out that enzalutamide can actually induce PSMA expression shortly after it's added. Now, with time, that seems to mitigate and go away. But you have to understand the timing and this possibility of what, for better terms, I'll use flare as the term to describe this phenomenon. Now, there is important data with gallium-68 and improving the prediction of overall survival after lutetium-177 PSMA. And here, after two cycles of lutetium 177, perhaps being able to look at the impact of therapy, but before the, the resistant disease begins to emerge, it began to see that those individuals had an SUV decline of greater than 30%. That group of patients had an overall survival of 16.5 months. If they had new lesions, then it was 6.2 months on the PSMA PET. And if they had the PSMA SUV decline of less than 30%, than an overall survival only 9.8 months. Again, we need to put bigger trials in place here, but these are important findings. In summary, disease localization by PSMA PET is important, but there's more to the story. We know that the gallium-68 PSMA-11 can be used to select patients for the lutetium 177 PSMA therapy, and whether or not this might also apply to other forms of PSMA-directed therapy, we're gonna to need to explore. That said, optimal selection criteria are yet to be fully determined. We also know that there are important relationships between SUV uptake and response to therapy, but the type of therapy, the timing, and the tumor location are all potential and variables. So we have initial encouraging data, but we do have caveats that apply, particularly th with things like enzalutamide. So overall, it's really been a pleasure to help cover these issues today regarding PSMA PET. There really is no doubt that we're gaining new insights by this important uh, new imaging technology. And I really want to thank 
uh, both Dr. Kelly and Dr. Carnes for sharing their expertise with us. And now let's open it up for questions from the audience. 